All right, we are back again talking about global gene regulation, except this time we are not talking about um, transcriptional activators or repressors. We're actually talking about a subunit of RNA polymerase itself. So this um, short video is going to be on the use of alternative sigma factors to program gene expression. So to be clear, most genes in any bacterial species are transcribed using one dominant sigma subunit. Remember, sigma subunit is the subunit of RNA polymerase that identifies the promoter and tells the RNA polymerase where to start transcription. Okay, so in E. coli, it's called sigma 70 because that subunit is 70 kilodaltons in size. Um, there are other sigma subunits. Um, one called sigma-54 that regulates genes for nitrogen utilization, one called sigma-32 that regulates genes for responding to heat shock. This is a whole set of genes um, that are part of the sigma-32 regulon, right? So the set of genes that are controlled by that sigma subunit. The one we're actually gonna focus on in the next slide is sigma-28, which is a very small sigma subunit that is used to control the expression of genes involved in building a flagellum, okay? So remember when we were talking earlier about how, we, um, how a flagellum is built and operated, there are many different proteins involved that go from sort of the interface of the cytoplasmic membrane um, through the cell wall, through the outer membrane in a gram-negative bacteria. If you're gram-positive, you don't have this ring here, but Otherwise, it's still the same. You have a hook structure, and then outside of that is the actual filament, which can be very long here. This is just a simplified diagram. Now, building that elaborate structure along with the motor around it um, requires a whole series of genes, and they're organized into what's called a transcriptional regulatory hierarchy that is um, a temporally regulated series of um, gene, of, of regulons, if you want to call them that, okay? So we have the master regulator here at the top, the dominant um, sigma 70 associated with RNA polymerase works with this master um, transcription factor to turn on the expression of the early flagellar genes. So those are the ones that make the basal body, the rod penetrating through the cell envelope, these rings here, and then the hook, okay? And then the uh, rest of the filament along with the motor and the chemotaxis machinery that we were just talking about earlier. By the way, this TAR, TSR, and AER are all um, methyl accepting chemotaxis proteins, so the sensors, and then you're familiar with the, the key components for regulating um, the direction of rotation of the flagellum, right? Um, so these things are all part of a subsequent class of genes. The flea A gene, which is part of this middle group, the class two genes, encodes the sigma-28 protein. The sigma-28 protein is necessary for this, the RNA polymerase um, to recognize the promoters for these class three genes, okay? So these things all happen in order. FLHTC um, is expressed at low levels. That transcription factor turns on the expression of these genes under appropriate regulatory conditions. We won't talk about what those actually are. You make the early part, and only once that's done do you actually turn on the expression of these later genes to make the filament and the motor and the chemotaxis machinery. So the question is, how does that work? How is this alternative sigma factor regulated so that the timing is appropriate? Um, and here's the answer. So the FLEA gene is expressed, sigma 28 is made, but then sigma 28 does not actually do anything. It's held inactive until this hook is made, okay? And the way that that works is that there's a protein, the product of the FLIG-M gene, which is actually part of this class three, 
which when this is turned on, this feeds back to bind to sigma 28 and keep it from expressing all the rest of these. Now you need these flagellins at very high levels, okay? So this, um, it turns out this flagellin is expressed a little bit in class two, it has a, a weak sigma 70 promoter too. So there's some of this around. Anyway, this flig M is what's called an anti-sigma factor. It binds to sigma 28 and keeps it from doing anything. So until you get rid of flig M, the sigma 28 is not going to turn on these later genes. So how do you get rid of flig M? Well, flig M itself turns out to be associated with another protein called flig N. Flig N is associated with the secretory system here at the base of the flagellum and somehow only when this hook is actually finished being made does this flig n then kick the flig m out through this channel okay so the anti-sigma factor is ejected through the flagellar structure outside of the cell to release sigma 28 and that only happens after the hook is finished being made so somehow there is a signal here which until it is done that keeps flig m inside the cell where it keeps sigma 28 off and then when it's released the flig m is ejected from the cell so that sigma 28 can then do its job and express the rest of these genes, which can then add on, because the hook is now done, add on to make a functional filament. Okay, so this is a strategy for coupling morphology to regulation of gene expression, coupling the completion of the early um, structures of the flagellum all the way out to the hook um, to the production of flagellins to be able to make the filament. All right, I'm going to give you another example of how alternative sigma factors are used in bacteria. We haven't talked much about how endospores are made in bacillus, um, but it's, a, it's quite a complex developmental process. There's actually a video here that you can watch, which is um, nice, um, but here we just have these uh, still uh, electron micrographs of the um, bacillus cells undergoing endospore formation, okay? So this is actually a process of um, specialized cell division, okay? Because the chromosomes are replicated and there's going to be two progeny cells coming out of this, but one is going to be the mother cell, which is gonna be dead. The other is gonna be the endospore, which is gonna live on. Okay, so there's a lot of spatial and temporal regulation of gene expression that happens during endospore formation. Okay, so this is even more complex than building a flagellum. Right, so what's going to happen here? <clears throat> this is a diagram that's kind of showing the basics. Okay, um, this, the chromosomes have been replicated. There's one on each side of the cell here. These are sort of abortive, or uh, these are sort of getting ready to divide. And you notice that the division at the midpoint of the cell has been suppressed. So the division now at the quarter points of the cell is allowed to happen. Okay, so this is a very specialized, unusual process, right? Um, stage, so the, the, the stages of sporulation are all numbered here won't go into all these details, but basically this is just the temporal progression. And you can have mutations in genes that are important for development along the way that will arrest at these different stages, okay? So after these chromosomes um, are actually um, replicated, they undertake kind of a, a weird process of um, aligning into a specialized nucleoid Remember, no membrane here, just an organization nucleoid that's sort of uh, a long tube, uh, spindle is what it's often referred to as. Okay, so what's gonna happen now is that one of these division sites is gonna be selected, the other one will be suppressed. 
So you're going to have a small compartment and a large compartment, right? So this small compartment is going to ultimately turn into the endospore. Okay, so it starts to divide. And here's the weird thing. The um, DNA that was on this side of the cell division site um, basically gets destroyed. But the DNA that was on this side then gets pumped into this endospore here. Very strange, right? And then what starts to happen is the membranes from the what we're going to call the mother cell or the sporangium start going around this little compartment here that's going to turn into the spore. Okay, so they engulf this um, so that it's now completely inside the mother cell, right? And over time, the DNA actually um, in this mother cell gets degraded, but that takes a little while. At any rate, um, during this time, additional layers are being laid around the spore. The wall is getting really thick here. The, um, the water from the inside here is um, uh, dehydrated. It's, it's pumped out. Um, now, it looks like here that it's destroying the DNA. It is not destroying the DNA because, of course, this is going to be the spore that's going to end up having to um, generate a new functional cell when conditions get better. Remember, this only happens when the cells are like starving and in really harsh conditions. I should have made sure to point that out. Okay, this is a last ditch effort by the cells to have at least one of them survive. All right, so at any rate, that's what this is gonna be is a totally metabolically inert um, cell that when conditions get better, it can then divide again. All right, why am I telling you all this? So I wanted to go over the regulation process here and there's two aspects of the regulation I wanna go over. One has to do with um, basically a two component system that's now stretched out into a multi-component system, right? Um, and this is at the early, so when the cells start experiencing stress and nutrient limitation, they decide, hmm, I have a choice here. I can try all my other tricks to try and get new nutrients, right? I can secrete proteases. I can try and swim away. I can do everything I can. But if it's just not working, then I'm going to give it up and I'm going to say, I'm going to form a spore. Okay, so we decide to form a spore. Down here at the very end is the sort of master sporulation regulator called SPO0A. SPO0A is a response regulator that needs to be activated by phosphorylation. Okay, SPO0A will get its phosphate from SPO0B, but SPO0B is merely a link in the chain of a series of phosphate transfer events that start clear up here with two kinases, one called KIP-A, one called KIN-A. Okay, um, Kin A is a really important one here. Kip A is actually just a regulator of it. So Kin A gets phosphorylated by ATP here under conditions where it, the cell has decided that it is stressed out and it's going to form a spore. Exactly what those conditions are is, uh, well, there's a lot of people that have studied it and it's complicated. There's multiple signals that seem to turn this on. But Kin A is the key starting point here. Um, Kip I can suppress this. Kip A can suppress Kip I. So positive signals come into Kip A that can suppress Kip I. Kip I, though, can actually be a receiver of sporulation suppressing signals like, oh, I found another source of food over here. Or I swam someplace where there was more food. I don't want to do this after all. So signals start turning this off, right? But basically what happens is the kin A gets phosphorylated, then it donates its phosphate to SPO0F. Now ordinarily in a two-component two system, SPO0F would be the key response regulator. But SPO0F isn't the end uh, regulator here. It actually donates its phosphate to something that looks like a kinase, but can't really phosphorylate on its own. It receives the phosphate from SPO0F, and then it donates its phosphate to SPO0A. So this has been termed a phosphorelay, right? And there are phosphatases that can suppress this by chewing the phosphates off of these key um, factors as well. At the end of all this, 
is a set of genes that are involved in turning on all those events that I showed you in the previous slide to, to trigger and carry out the developmental process. So like 40 genes um, that it directly regulates, and then there's a bunch more genes that are downstream. Um, actually, I take that back. It activates directly the expression of 40 genes. It represses the expression of more than 80 genes, okay? Because you can imagine if you're trying to do these things, but they're not working and you decide to go to, down this path, you wanna turn this stuff off, okay? So things are turned both off and on by SPO0A. All right, so phosphorylay gets this whole thing started. Then what happens? Well, then there is a developmental program that gets going. Um, there's a sigma subunit, uh, it's called sigma H here, which has been active in the, um, the, the vegetative cell, essentially, that's just deciding whether to support, undergo spore formation, right? So this um, sigma subunit is sort of the, the, the vegetative sigma subunit that SPO0A works with. SPO0A turns on the expression of two other sigma subunits, sigma E and sigma F. Sigma F turns out through some really interesting developmental processes um, that I don't think I will take the time to tell you how they work. Turns on in, in the endospore compartment, sigma E turns on in the mother cell compartment, right? And then once sigma F is done its early job in the uh, spore, it gives way to sigma G, sigma E gives way to sigma K, and these things all control those series of events that give rise to the developmental process, all right? Um, I think I've talked about this for long enough already, although I find this stuff all super interesting, and one of the reasons I wanted to tell you about it is because, again, it involves anti-sigma factors and sigma factors um, and anti-anti-sigma factors. Um, so it's all really interesting, but it, honestly, it takes a while to explain. I will put a paper on that you can read um, that explains it all. Um, the other important thing to recognize here is that there is communication between these compartments to coordinate the temporal series of events. So I said sigma F gives way to sigma G, sigma E gives way to sigma K, but sigma E actually only turns on after sigma F is turned on. So there's communication across compartments. Then sigma E is necessary to turn on sigma G in the other compartment. Then sigma G is, response, is necessary to turn on sigma K. So you have temporal and spatial regulation of uh, gene expression during this complex process of spore formation. So again, I'm putting a, I'll put a paper describing the basics of this onto the Camino site so you can read more about it, or at least um, you can get more of the basics here. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. There's one last um, short video for you to watch that has to do with um, RNA-based regulation of gene expression. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this now and I am going to stop